Hey, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, How to Calibrate Pressure Instruments, Part 1, co-hosted by ISA and BMAX. My name is Stacey Logan. I'm with ISA and will be hosting today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. First, in regards to the question and answer sessions. We will have two Q&A sessions today, one 10-minute Q&A within the presentation and another session at the end. If we are unable to get to your question during the midway Q&A, we will hold it until the final question and answer session. To submit your questions, simply type them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're viewing along with others at your site, please designate a scribe to submit your group's questions. Do not use the chat toolbox for your questions for the Q&A sessions. If you have miscellaneous questions for me, the host, submit those into the chat toolbox. Unfortunately, with a large amount of pre-registrants, we cannot open the phone lines for questions. If we don't get a chance to respond to your question, or if you would like to, dis to discuss a topic in more detail with one of the presenters, feel please feel free to contact them directly, and that information will be given at the end of the webinar. Second, for those of you who have just joined, please make sure that you are on mute. Both your computer and phone microphones should be muted. If you would like to see the phone and audio broadcast connection instructions again, please refer to the confirmation email I sent you today. Or if you go to the top left-hand side of your WebEx screen, you will see a tab labeled Meeting Info. Some of the connection instructions are included there as well. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our presenters today. First up, we have Roy Tomolino. Roy is a professional services engineer with BMAX. He has been teaching calibration management for 13 years and has taught on four different continents to people from over 40 countries. Roy has worked for Hewlett Packard as a corporate trainer, leading new product introduction and managing worldwide training activities. He was also previously a key player with Honeywell at their Fort Collins, Colorado office, where he supported the document calibration management software, and Honeywell's 2020 portable calibrator as a trainer, certified developer, and technical advisor. Roy holds a BS in computer information systems from Regis University and an AAS in electronics technology from Denver Institute of Technology, both located in Denver, Colorado. Roy is also Six Sigma Green Belt certified. Today, Roy conducts educational training sessions and provides technical support to BMX customers. Technical Director Ned Espy has been promoting calibration management with BMX for almost 20 years. Ned has helped develop best practices for calibration with a focus on pressure, temperature, and multivariable instruments. He is a consistent editorial contributor to leading industry publications and has received significant recognition within the automation industry. Recently, Ned contributed to the 416-page book, The Engineer's Guide to Industrial Temperature Measurement. Earlier in 2004, he wrote a paper titled Improved Measurement and Control Utilizing Advanced Calibration Strategies, which he presented at the ISA Power Industry Division Symposium this past June. Today, Ned teaches calibration best practices and provides technical support to end users and the BMEX sales team in North America. Hunter Vegas has worked in the automation industry for nearly 29 years and has executed over 2,000 automation projects in the nuclear, pulp and paper, and specialty chemistry industries. He is a frequent contributor to several controls magazines and recently co-published his first book, 101 Type Tips for a Successful Automation Career, along with Greg McMillan. Hunter currently works for Wonderlic Malik as a project engineering manager and resides in North Carolina. Okay, let's get started. I'd like to ask Ned to take it from here. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Ned Espy, and uh, we really appreciate you taking time, and thank you for participating in our presentation on pressure. Uh, we're calling this Pressure Part 1, and uh, we will be telling you a little bit about Part 2 later in the presentation. Uh, to go through, uh, the listing here, just very quickly, I have a couple slides I'm going to go over on just the basic concepts of calibration, which will then lead us into pressure. And again, we want to kind of cover the basics. For the, so for those experts out there, don't be offended, but we want to get everybody on a level playing field. Uh, then we're going to move in and talk about 
different types of pressure measurements and units that, uh, and all three of us will, will kind of take turns showing this, and uh, we'll even have a live demonstration using a calibrator. That'll lead us to our first Q&A session. We'll keep it kind of brief, but uh, hopefully we can shore up any questions that we generate, and then we'll move on and, and actually do some real in-depth demonstrations of some common applications that people have in industry. And then, uh, then we'll conclude with a much longer session for question and answers, and we'll try to take as, and handle as many things as come in. Okay, so let me advance the slide here. We're going to talk about some basics on calibration. And the first thing you see is SI units. I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. And, and SI comes from the, uh, the French version or French saying for Le Système International de Unité. And for those in the United States, it's, it's the International System of Units. And, um, and when we talk about making good measurements, uh, we're really talking about good metrology practice. So we want to bring a little science when we're making measurements uh, in the process industry. So with good metrology practice, you want to demonstrate a pedigree. So kind of, if you look at the chain on the left, the idea is, is that when you're making a field measurement at the bottom of the chain, you're showing traceability all the way back to international standards that are recognized by mutual lateral agreement for all countries. And as a basic definition for calibration, it, it's pretty simple, comparing a measured value to a known reference value. That, that's, that's pretty much calibration in a, in a nutshell. And as I alluded on traceability, you want to you wanna show that, that the measurement value of a standard can be related to stated references, uh, which are in the United States would be NIST, which is then recognized internationally for uh, for the types of measurements measurements we make. Okay, so why do people calibrate? And uh, in essence, when you're calibrating an instrument, you're trying to verify and possibly adjust it and I'm talking about a transmitter or sensor, back to its good as new condition. So when you installed it, it drifts, you want to bring it back to where it belongs. Uh, how often you do this activity is determined different ways. Most common really is your industry practices. And a lot of people I talk to say, well, this is what we always do. But, um, but really, there's good business reasons to calibrate, and we've got a few listed here. So if you talk about market forces, if you've got a quality program, you need to document your calibration. You may have corporate mandates for a system that you're trying to uh, be part of. But, you know, to be competitive, to save energy, calibration can make an impact on your bottom line. Also, there's some uh, maybe less desirable forces, but you've got OSHA breathing down your neck for boilers and things. If you're in the pharmaceutical industry, I don't even have to say, talk about FDA. The nuclear power industry has the NRC, and most everybody has to deal now with EPA on greenhouse gas emissions and so on. And, and also many times insurance companies are looking to see that you have good practices for your maintenance. So that covers some basic concepts on calibration, and, and now I'm going to let Hunter talk about um, the basics on, on what is pressure and, and so on. So, Hunter, let me uh, click it over to you. All right. <clears throat> I'm um, going to cover some kind of whimsical uh, demonstrations of pressure to sort of get everybody on the same page. And we're going to start on the beach in Florida. You're sitting there. You're enjoying your cold beverage of choice. You have the breeze in your face, nice sunset. The question I have for you is, are you under pressure? And, and in fact, the answer is, why, yes, you're actually under an incredible amount of pressure, a great deal more than you might think. Um, as you lay there on the beach in Florida, you actually have over 200 miles of air above you. And while air doesn't seem to weigh much, 
200 miles actually does. And in fact, it weighs 14.7 pounds per square inch. So that means that every square inch of your body has 14.7 pounds pushing down on it. And if you're like me and you might have a few extra square inches more than you might like, that can work into tons of pressure pushing on you all at the same time. Now, fortunately for all of us, we also have that same pressure on the inside pushing back out so we don't crush it like a beer can. But the fact of the matter is we're under a great deal of pressure all the time. And we're going to come back to our friend on the beach here in a little bit. And I'm going to take you now to a kitchen in South Africa. Let's say you live in South Africa and you put in a beautiful, nice kitchen floor and you're standing back and you're admiring the, the wonderful wood floor and suddenly the door opens and a raging 14,000-pound African bull elephant charges across your kitchen floor. Well, now, of course, the first thing that's going to cross your mind, I'm sure, is, oh, my gosh, is he going to damage my kitchen floor? And let's, let's investigate that. So an African bull elephant weighs roughly 14,000 pounds. He always has at least two feet on the ground, and each foot carries about 7,000 pounds. Each foot has a 20-inch diameter circle. So the area of the foot is pi r squared, or about 314 square inches. Therefore, the pressure on the floor is 7,000 pounds divided by 314, or 22.3 pounds per square inch. Good news, your floor can easily handle that. It is not going to be damaged. So then you move on, and uh, the elephant leaves, and a thin young woman walks across your floor wearing high-heeled shoes. Will she damage your floor? Well, let's investigate this. She weighs roughly 120 pounds. Uh, as she walks, one heel strikes the for, uh, floor first, so each two is going to carry half her weight or about 60 pounds. Now, the area of her heel is about a half by half inch, and that's actually not even a spiked heel. That's kind of just a regular heel. Um, so that's about a quarter of a square inch, so the pressure she's putting on is 60 divided by a quarter inch or 240 pounds per square inch on your floor. Yes, that's right. The woman is putting over 10 times the pressure on your floor that the African bull elephant is. Now, at this point, my safety and legal departments require me to pass on this important safety tip. Do not tell your wife and or significant other that she's doing more damage to your floors than a raging 14,000-pound bull elephant. The point of this is not to cause marital Armageddon. The point is that pressure equals force divided by unit area. And, and that can often work out in ways that we don't, might not anticipate, at least initially. Um, you know, if you have a large amount of force, but it's spread out over a large area, the net pressure is small. So the elephant only put 22 pounds per square inch on your floor. But the fact of the matter is that was over a lot of square inches. And so the net force on your floor was 14,000 pounds. So while the local pressure might not be high, your floor better be very strong to carry the extra 14,000 pound load. Um, another case might be in the tornado. Uh, when the tornado passes over, near the bottom of the funnel cloud, you will get a net loss of pressure of over a pound per square inch. So if you're in a house that has a funnel cloud passing over it, suddenly the air outside the house drops by at least a pound per square inch, and suddenly every square inch in your house has a pound of force pushing on it. So an 8 by 12 wall now has seven tons trying to push the wall over. Your ceiling has got tons and tons of force pushing it up. Every wall has got that many tons of force pushing out. And often the damage to houses isn't due to the wind damage. It's due to the fact that the houses actually explode from within because they can't equalize pressure fast enough. Uh, the reverse of that is also true. Um, a little bit of force focused in a very small area can generate a tremendous amount of local pressure. So in the case of the high yield shoe, the woman doesn't weigh hardly anything at all compared to the elephant, certainly. But the local pressure is very, very high. Um, in a similar case, you might be working with lumber all day long, you're wearing gloves, you never have an issue, but suddenly a very small, sharp splinter has just a little bit of force behind it but because the point is so tiny, it goes right through your glove and into your hand. So the takeaway from all this is pressure equals force over unit area, and you need to take both of those into account when you're understanding or studying pressure. From there, we're going to go to tanks. Um, a common myth that confuses a lot of people and that they get confused on is that they think that the shape of the tank uh, affects the pressure in the bottom. In this case, we have four tanks. One is like a water tower. One is very uh, 
tall and thin, one's an upside down water tower, one kind of a regular tank shape. And the question is, if I've got a pressure gauge in the bottom of all of those tanks, what will it read? Well, if the tanks are 23 feet tall, all of them, and they all are filled with water, I'll tell you that a one inch by one inch by 23 foot column of water weighs 10 pounds, so every gauge reads 10 pounds. The shape of the tank has no impact at all on the pressure at the bottom of the tank. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. The only thing that matters is the height of the liquid. So if we take that, those same four tanks and now we fill them with mercury, which happens to be about 13.6 times the weight of water, what will the gauges read then? Again, shape does not matter. It's the height of the liquid that matters. And so we have the 10 PSI reading times the 13.6. So each gauge reads 136 pounds. Again, Shape doesn't matter, only the height of the liquid, and in this case, the gravity of the liquid. You multiply the height times the gravity in order to determine the pressure at the bottom. And one last change is that if I take a tank, and let's say I want to suppress the mercury cube, and so I add a tank uh, blanketing system on top, and uh, we'll say it's got one pound of pressure on it. Now what is the gauge going to read? Well, it's going to read the 136 pounds of the tank being full plus the one PSI on top. And this one picture here gives you a flavor for when you're calibrating a transmitter, a differential pressure transmitter, and you're reading the pressure at the bottom and you're trying to determine the level, you can see the three things that matter are the height of the liquid, the gravity of the liquid, and any pressure on top of the liquid pushing down as well. All of those are going to impact the pressure. And so when you're trying to convert pressure into a tank level, you have to take all those items into account. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Deb and let him tell you about um, the pressure, various pressure measurements. All right. Thank you, Hunter. Um, before we make a, a demonstration, let's take a quick review of the different types of pressure scales that we might encounter and, and also review some common units. Uh, if you look over on the left, the first arrow is trying to represent absolute pressure. And uh, when we talk about where is zero, it, it's saying an, it's an absolute vacuum. So one way to think of zero PSIA or, or whatever units you're using, uh, think of it as there's just no molecules. You, you use a vacuum compressor, extract all the media out of a tank or vessel, and you're, you're trying, you know, if there were no molecules in the tank, that would be absolute zero, which is what you would be able to uh, experience out in space. Uh, the next arrows, we've got one pointing positive, one pointing negative. We're talking about gauge pressure. And when we talk about gauge pressure, we're, we're saying that zero is the ambient barometric pressure. Uh, so, so like if when you measure the air pressure in your tires, for example, it's, it's relative to the 14.7 pounds that Tunner alluded to earlier in his discussion. And uh, if you wanted to pull a vacuum going towards absolute zero, you, it, it would be a negative number as you move away from the ambient pressure. So, and then the final kind of a hybrid is differential pressure. In this case, we're showing something elevated. It could be zero crossing across the barometric line, but we don't really care what the, it's a, it's a closed system. We really don't care what the ambient pressure is or what absolute pressure is. We're looking at the difference between a high and low leg. So zero would be when those two legs are, are connected together that, that would be the zero differential. Okay, we also have a listing of units, and um, you know, units is a real headache. Um, BMEX in our calibrators, we have some 60 different pressure units defined in our calibrators. Um, and when we go to different plants, everybody's got different units that they deal with. But we've got a few listed here, and when we remember on my slide about SI, we talked about SI units, and, and KPA and PSI are, are recognized standard units. 
because KPA is newtons per square meter. I guess we've got an attendee that needs to mute his uh, microphone. And um, PSI, which is pounds per square inch, kind of a similar similar type of mathematical formula. And, and KPA is BMEX's official pressure unit, and I would say that that's pretty typical of most metrology equipment vendors. Their their pressure is going to be stated in KPA. So. Everything else is a calculation. Now, on our list here, we have atmospheres. I want to talk a little bit about that. It's kind of interesting. It's not a, it's not an official SI unit. It's kind of an unofficial unit, but it was adopted in 1954, and it was intended to represent atmospheric pressure at the mean sea level at the latitude of Paris, France. And if we have any French people online, that They'll, they'll all tell you that that's the center of the universe. So, so, so one atmosphere is would be the standard pressure observed in Paris, France, if it were at sea level, and it is representative of pressures around the world at sea level. But the latitude is going to make small differences. Um, moving down the list, we also have bars. Bars is KPA, and uh, it's just a factor of two decimal places, a factor of 100, and it, it's very close to an atmosphere. And so think of a bar as, and bar and KPA is kind of like centimeters and meters. So it's just a decimal place difference. And then we have good old inches of water. We're showing that it's 407 inches at one atmosphere. So but really, inches of water is used for gauge or differential measurements. It's really not used for absolute, which is what we're referencing here. And then millimeters of mercury is, is an even 760, which is equal to one atmosphere. And that's coming from an Italian guy named Evangelista Torricelli, who actually invented the barometer. And he observed that the normal pressure was around 76 centimeters. In, with mercury in a tube. So that kind of leads us to the last unit, inches of mercury. That's that's pretty much what we see on television and the Weather Channel as uh, the ambient pressure. So notice that, you know, 30 inches of mercury is kind of like the weather, you know, what we, what we think of about the weather. And it is affected by altitude. So um, instead of inches of mercury, I'm showing PSIA. But uh, I've got the Outer Banks listed for sea level. That's where I like to go to the beach. So when you're at the beach, like Hunter said, you've got your local PSI of 14.7. But here in Atlanta, Georgia, where I am, we're at 1,000 feet elevation. And uh, on a nice normal day, our pressure is going to be a little bit lower. It's going to be there's less molecules, and uh, we're at 14.2. And you're going to see with Roy in a minute up in Denver, which is the Mile High City, that he's going to be somewhere around 12 PSIA. So, so when you're using a calibrator, these are the numbers you're going to see when you're working in absolute mode. But even if you're in Denver or Atlanta, we're always going to see 30 inches of mercury reported by the Weather Channel. So they... Uh, the weather people and the airports, they're compensating the local pressure to what it would be at sea level, kind of an interesting concept. And, and it's very important at the airport because people are calculating their altitude based on that number. So I got this from Wikipedia. You lose about 1.2 kPa per 100 meters in elevation, or that equates to about 0.3 psi for 500 feet. So, you know, another thing to know about pressure is that it is affected by uh, the ambient or by the temperature and humidity and the altitude and, and the latitude. So all these things will affect us. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Hunter and um, let him wrap up some of these concepts. All right. Um I appreciate it, Ned, for covering that, and hopefully his um, 
his introduction will make this next section a little bit easier. Uh, we're going to get into scales, various pressure scales, and vacuum scales. Uh, scales tend to uh, mess with people's heads quite a bit. People tend to get confused because, as Ned said, there are so many different units that it's hard to understand exactly what you're talking about. So we're going to kind of go through all of that here on the next few slides. And we're going to start with our friend back on the beach with his 200 miles of air above you and above him. And, and as you might remember, we said that was 14.7 pounds per square inch on him. And in fact, that is PSIA, or pounds per square inch absolute. Um, an absolute scale, any absolute scale, reads zero at the lowest possible value. So an absolute scale will never go negative. It will only go to zero, and zero is the lowest number you can get. So absolute temperature, uh, a zero would be basically absolute zero or about minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit or 207, minus 273 degrees centigrade. Uh, in absolute pressure measurements, zero is the vacuum of space. So if we have our PSIA gauge and we start off in space, it's going to read zero. And as we head down to the beach, eventually it'll go to 14.7 PSIA. Now, let's say that our friend couldn't find his inner tube, and so he decided to bring a spare tire along to float with out in the ocean. And he takes his gauge and he measures the pressure inside the tire. Well, a tire normally has about 30 pounds of pressure in it, and that's 30 pounds over the local pressure, and so his gauge would actually read 44.7 PSIA, or 30 pounds more than the 14.7 he would have read with no pressure at all around it. Okay, well, no one actually normally measures in absolute units. Most of the time, people measure in gauge pressure. And so if we, here are, how, here are absolute uh, pressure measurements. The gauge version of it basically says, look, I'm going to ignore the pressure around me. I know the atmosphere is there. It's always there. I'm just going to call that zero and only measure in relation to the air around it. So if he takes his PSIG scale, it's going to read zero if it's, not, if it's just measuring the air, and it's going to read 30 pounds when he puts it on his tire. If he takes that gauge and he brings it up to space, it'll actually read minus 14.7, which is a pure, pure vacuum. So you can see in this particular case, at least for the PSI unit, the difference between a PSIG and a PSIA is generally a 14.7 pound shift from one to the other. One starts at zero, the other one starts at minus 14.7. With that, we're going to go to vacuum. Now, the vacuum setup to kind of understand some of the rather goofy units that are used for vacuum actually throws back to the gentleman Ned was mentioning who invented the barometer. Um, the barometer basically is a tube of um, a tube, and it's stuck inside a jar of mercury. And because you've got air pressure pushing on the top of the mercury, if I hook a, the tube up to a vacuum pump and start pulling all of the air out, the vacuum, the mercury is going to slowly rise up in the tube, and eventually it's going to reach a point where it'll go no higher. So if I have a pure pure vacuum, I've pulled all the air out I can. At that point, you're going to find that generally it'll be about 30 inches of mercury or 760 millimeters of mercury. And that is where those units come from, is actually the height of the mercury that would be pulled if you had a pure vacuum in a tube. So here's kind of a variety of different units. Um, these are gauge scales. Obviously, they're reading minus numbers, so that means it can't be absolute. Um, but just to make things different and to cause grief, some people don't say minus 30 inches of mercury, they say, hey, I'm just going to call that, I'm measuring vacuum, and so 30 inches of vacuum is a pure vacuum. And so it's actually a positive number just to make things interesting. All right, so these are the gauge scales that are used for vacuum. And the absolute scales are, as we said, zero would be the minus, the smallest number you can get. So pure vacuum is going to read PS, zero PSIA, and no vacuum would be 14.7. Similarly, inches of mercury or millimeters of mercury uh, would all have zero as the minimum pure vacuum state, and 30 inches or 760 millimeters of mercury would be normal atmospheric pressure at sea level. And here's all of them just to show you that you could see any one of these numbers just depending on the particular scale you use. And as I said, that is kind of the fun part of all this is just to keep you on your toes. They seem to change scales all the time. Um, and the last scale I'm going to talk about is inches of water. This is actually a 
a unit that's very common in the U.S. Most um, metric uh, countries do not use this unit. Uh, in fact, WC means water closet in uh, Europe. But in America, uh, this inches of water column, and an inch of water is a very small unit. Basically, it's the weight of a one by one by one inch cube of water. Um, it's normally used in differential pressure measurements. Uh, 27.7 inches of mercury equals 2.3 feet. I'm sorry, uh, 27.7 inches of water equals 2.3 feet of water, which would equal one PSI. And with that, I am going to turn this over to Roy, who is going to show you the pressure readings in Colorado and um, see what he's reading today. Roy, it's all you. And you're muted. Thank you, Hunter. Let me share my application. So at this point, we're looking at the pressure in Colorado. So I'm at altitude. Normally we would see 14.7 PSI if we were sitting uh, at sea level. But here at a mile high, we're at 12.322 PSI roughly. Now if we change the units, let me change this to from PSI to let's, see, let's do atmosphere. So as we know now from Ned, if we were sitting on the, the coast of France, we'd be looking at one atmosphere as far as pressure. So here we're at a higher altitude, so that will be a smaller pressure. Let me change units to inches of mercury. We'd be looking at almost 30 inches of mercury at sea level, but here we're looking at about 25. To show you what it looks like to go from absolute to gauge, let me bring up gauge as far as inches of mercury. And you know, let me change the units back to PSI. So I've got 0 0.0006 PSI gauge. So gauge, if we zero it, it'll zero it at the, at the pressure that you're at right now and then either go in a positive direction or a negative vacuum direction. So let me hit zero on this. So now we're zeroed out as far as pressure and now we'll go from gauge to absolute. So now I'm reading 12.32. And again, if we were at a lower altitude, sea level, it would be closer to 14.7. Now with this, I'd like to introduce our first Q&A session. If you guys, if our audience does have any questions, feel free to put that in the Q&A. And I will go ahead and turn this over to you, Stacy. Okay, great. Thanks, Roy. Okay, we'd now like to move into our first Q&A session of this webinar. Um, we've already received some good questions. I encourage everyone to join in the discussion and submit your question at any time using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. If we miss your question, we will hold it until the final Q&A at the end. Okay, our very first question is, can you please clarify what sealed gauge measurements are? Yeah, Stacy, this is Ned. I think I can tackle this one. Um, a sealed gauge measurement is um, it, it's a gauge sensor where they get on the reference side of the sensor and and pull a hard vacuum. So they they pull as hard a vacuum as they can on the on the reference side of the sensor, and then they seal it with an epoxy or or some type of glue. And when you when you do that with a sensor, you can't quite get it down to zero PSIA, it's, it's going to have some little leftover pressure that you couldn't evacuate. So, uh, so they'll actually calibrate it to a true zero and then um, it, you know, it can measure absolute pressure without having to worry about the reference side. And it's really not accurate for a low measurement. You're not going to make measurements with a sealed sensor below 15 PSIA or, or ambient pressure. It's typically uh, a style of sensor used for hundreds of PSI or 1,000 PSI. Uh, we see these in, in different industry applications uh, where, you know, maybe in a pipeline or something where there's a high static pressure. So you can use a sealed gauge sensor to make a good, accurate, absolute measurement at that, at that higher pressure. I don't know, Hunter or 
Roy, you got any other comments on it? I think you covered it. Okay. Okay. Um, I encourage everyone to ask any questions that may have come to mind during the first portion of this presentation. Um, make sure you make sure you do um, enter those into the Q and A box and not the chat box. We're actually going to go ahead and move along to the second part of this presentation. And Hunter, if you want to take it from here. I appreciate it. All right. So now that we've finally covered all of the various scales and vacuum and pressure and talked about what it all is, let's actually calibrate some stuff. Um, first item we're going to talk about is a pretty standard orifice plate. Uh, let's say you want to measure the flow in a uh, airline. And one way you might do that is to put an orifice plate inside the airline. And the orifice plate is a plate that's got a hole in it that's smaller than the uh, pipe itself. And as the air flows through it, it creates a differential pressure uh, high in front and slightly be a negative behind it uh, compared to the pressure inside the pipe. So if you take a, a DP transmitter and you measure that differential air pressure, you can equate that to flow. Now, one thing you need to know about uh, this particular application is that if you double the flow, the differential pressure will increase by a factor of four. If you triple the flow, the differential pressure will increase by a factor of nine. Uh, it's a squared relationship between differential pressure and airflow or flow in general. So you need to take the square root of the, that differential pressure in order to convert that or relate that to a given flow. Um, normally that square root process is actually not done in the transmitter, but usually done in the DCS because that way you know that it's being done there and you can see it. If you do it in the field, um, often what will happen is the DCS guy won't know that and then he'll take the square root of it again in the DCS and that obviously causes problems. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Roy and let him uh, actually do that calibration and, and it's all you, sir. All right, thank you, Hunter. Let me just share my calibrator. So I've got video on here as well, and I do want to let everyone know that you can adjust the size of the video by just grabbing on the corner. For example, the lower left-hand corner, you can click and drag and make the video a little larger. You can also double-click on the video, but that will make the video take up the entire screen. And if you do that and can't figure out how to get back, you can click on the top right hand corner and there's a box that will say exit full screen and that will get you out of the full screen video section. But again, you can resize that video. And I'm sharing the, a screen that has my calibrator on it. So just a little intro to this. So I've got a, a calibrator right here and it's easier if I use this little remote controller application on my screen so you can see exactly what I'm doing but I'm connecting to a pressure transmitter and I'll be supplying loop power from the calibrators as well as measuring pressure from one of the pressure ports on top. So I've got a pressure hose hooked up to that as well. And also, just for you, I'll be clicking on the screen instead of touching it on the, the color touch screen just so you can see where I'm pressing. Let me get the connections back on here. The first instrument I'll do here is a DP cell. This one is is a, a Siemens and I'm connected up to the output of it and I'm also hooking up to the high side. With a DP you've got a high and a low side. I'll have the low side open to atmosphere and I'll hook up to the high side in order to do this test. And before I do that, one more thing. This transmitter is set up for 0 to 100 inches of water. And inches of water is a primarily a North American unit, and I want to be respectful to everybody. We do have a, an international audience here. We have, uh, over, well, we have 39 countries represented, so I appreciate everybody for coming online and watching our webinar. So this could easily be uh, bar, kilopascals, PSI, it, but in this example I'm doing inches of water. And what I want to show 
is this transmitter is set up from 4 to 20 milliamps as an output. So 4 to 20 milliamps, and it happens to be rated 0 to 100 inches of water. So at 0 inches of water, we should be getting 4 milliamps. At the midpoint, 50 inches of water, we should be seeing roughly 12 milliamps. And then at 100 inches of water, we should be seeing 20 milliamps. So as long as I've drawn this correctly, we should be getting a straight line. Imagine that is a perfectly straight line. So this means it's a linear equation because this, or a linear function, because the line is straight. Now, along with this, we have error tolerance. We have to know how close do we want this to be. In this example, I'm doing a half a percent of span. So it could be plus or minus a half a percent. And if I draw a dashed line across up above and below this line, this is my tolerance. So my test points can be anywhere within these dotted lines, and it, they will be passing test points. I can also flatten it out. And if we look down here, this is my zero error, the straight line. And I've got dotted lines above and below it. This is my tolerance as well. So the, the top line is half a percent. And the bottom line is minus 0.5% of span. So my test points can be anywhere within here. I'll be doing a three up down test, which means I'll do a test point at 0%, I'll do a test point at 50%, and one at 100%, and then back down. I'll grab the 50 and the zero again. Now, Hunter mentioned a DP and flow and also a square root function. It is possible to have um, square root extraction done in the transmitter itself. In most cases, we see that done at the DCS level. So the transmitter, even though it's a DP flow, we're, we're getting a linear output. But I have worked with customers that do have a square root output from their transmitter. And instead of a straight line, you get more of a square root curve like this here. So you just have to tell the calibrator what to expect. Are we expecting a linear straight line or the square root curve? or maybe even a custom curve. So let's take a look. As far as connections, I'm using a 30 degree pipe fitting connector. This happens to look like this. I like using connectors that do not require any tools that you can do hand tight. Make sure I'm getting on the high side here. I know that was not a pun. I know I'm in Colorado, but this, there is a high and a low side here. So let me grab my remote. On the calibrator, I'll be clicking on the documenting calibrator. I already have two tests. We'll be doing two calibrations, and both will have their own individual problem with them. So to start with, we'll do PT505. This is a DP transmitter. We can tell that it's 0 to 100 inches of water on the input, and it's a 4 to 20 milliamp output. Let me hit the check mark. Now, I had, I'm had i using a pressure pump here. This is simply a, a handheld pressure pump. This goes up to 300 PSI and has a fine tuning knob and a vent on top. So in this case, let me, first of all, we zero pressure before we get started. So I'll click the zero on the bottom right. So we're zeroing our transducer for my current pressure, my current atmospheric pressure. Let me hit start. And you can see that there's a countdown here on, on the, the accept button. And it actually grabbed my zero right away. I only have a three second delay. It's looking for a stable signal that it'll count down three seconds and grab that test point automatically. Our next test point, if you look on the bottom right, is 50 inches input and we're expecting 12 milliamps out. So I'll increase the pressure. I've got a gray bar that it's set to, and I, I'm not gonna get perfect on purpose. I've got 50.37, and that's, that's okay for my demonstration here. The gray bar that I'm aiming at is actually plus or minus 4% of my target. So plus or minus 4% of my 100 inches now on my 100% test point. Let me increase the pressure, and I can either watch the graph or I can watch the number itself. And I just have to get it close. So even 99.6 or 0.59, you, 
it's going to calibrate the output for whatever input that I have. So I don't have to get it exactly on. It'll still calculate it. And then we can see right now above the graph, I have a 0.644% of span error where I'm at currently. And the graph is the same thing that I showed you on that piece of paper. Our middle line is zero. And the blue lines above and below represent our tolerance. So that's plus or minus half a percent of span. Now, I'll crack the vent and let, let the pressure just fall down to my midpoint. So I keep, if your pressure pump supports this, it's, it's rather nice. In some cases, if you vent it, you might lose all pressure. But I really like this feature, especially doing pressure switches as well. You can just vent it and let it just drift down until your switch resets. So I'm just waiting for it to get close. And now I'll close off my vent. And again, I don't have to get exactly 50. I can get close and it will calculate the error from the input versus the output. And the 0%, that's the easiest one. Let me just, I'll vent out my pump, I'll set it down, and it'll count down three seconds once it's stable. Now, did this pass or fail? How could we know? Well, there's a couple things. Number one, there's a big red failed across the main screen. And it also tells us the maximum error. The max error we got was 0.59% of span. So we know that our limit was half a percent. And that's what the significance means, is we were 118% of our error tolerance. Let me arrow down. We can put in who calibrated it, but if I go down again, then I can see my graph. And we can see exactly what happened. We have a little bit of hysteresis in our zero. And that might have gone away if I had a little bit more delay. I only put in a three second, just because I'm trying to, to get this going pretty quick for you guys. Now, what's our problem? It's obvious from our graph that because the problem is, uh, is on the uh, right-hand side, it's our span. We have to fix our span. Our zero is pretty pretty close. Our midpoint is pretty close to linear, so that looks okay. And I can arrow down again and see all of our raw data. We can see exactly where it was. Yep, our greatest error was on the high side. So let me save this. So I'll hit the disk on there to save. I'll do an as found. So if I were a technician, what what would I do? Now let me put my technician hat on here. As a technician, do I want a failing as found test? Not really. No, I don't. But you need to capture that data. You need to save it. As ugly as it is, if I didn't record this as found data that was failing, I would lose my trending capability. If you gather your data, you can look at a history trend if you have tests done annually over a 10-year period, you can see how the transmitter ends up drifting up or down, or maybe it's rock solid. Maybe it needs to be adjusted every single time you go out, and that information is important. And that's why you save this as found that failed, and not just erase it, trim it, and do another test that's perfect. So this, this does not affect you, your level as a technician, but the failure involves the transmitter itself. It's not you. So at this point, let me start the communicator. Because this is a smart transmitter, this one happens to be HART, as opposed to another smart protocol such as field bus, foundation field bus or profi bus. Because it is HART, we, we can't use our little adjustment screwdrivers. There are no potentiometers that we can adjust for zero and span. But the concept is still the same. And because we know that the problem wasn't on the zero side, but it was on the high side, we know that our span needs to be adjusted. We may go in here and, and do our zero as well. I'm thinking for time's sake, I may just do the span. So let's hop in here and take a look. Right now, the calibrator is acting as a communicator. And I'll go into device setup. And I want Diag service. And all manufacturers are, are different, but there's a common theme, either Diag service or maintenance, something like that. 
and I want sensor trim in this case. I could do a zero trim or a lower, but let me go right to upper. Warning, loop should be removed from automatic control. Okay, it is, because it's sitting on my desk. There is no automatic control. But you'd also want to let someone know that if, if you are working on it, that somebody at the DCS, they're going to get an alarm. Apply high pressure, okay. So the communicator part is, is the section up on top, and then we've got the calibrator set to monitor the input and the output of the transmitter. So this gives us an advantage. Now, I need to take this up to my 100%, which is 100 inches of water. Then I'll let that stabilize a little bit. So I'll let this stabilize, and again, I'm just using this, this hand pump. I'll use my fine tuning if I need to. We'll pull that down just a little bit. And then I'm a firm believer when you let something sit to put the hand pump down. You definitely don't want any heat from your hands to affect the air inside of the hose. So I'll set it down here and get it a little closer. All right, so we'll take 100 there, and I'll press the check mark, press OK when it's stable. It's OK. Now it's at 99.99, but it's still 100, so I'll, I'll tell it, you know what, I'm actually putting in 99.98 right now, and we'll see how it adjusts the current. Across the top, it says sensor trim executing method. When that's going on, it's actually the processor within the transmitter itself that's working, so you have to just hold tight and not do anything until that goes away. And while this is executing, while it's running the trim, okay, now it's done. Let me hit the X here. And now I have roughly 100 inches into this transmitter, and it's you can see we have a live error of negative 0 0.01, roughly. Now let me vent out this pressure pump. So we've just trimmed our our span, and our zero is still off a little bit. Our zero is still... It is coming down a little bit. Our zero probably could be trimmed a little bit, and normally I would trim them both, but for the sake of time, I'll skip it. I don't need to re-zero my pressure transducer. Let me hit start. And it sees that that signal is stable, so it's gonna grab that. Now I need to do my midpoint, so I'll close off my vent. We'll take it up now. Increase my pressure, hit my 50% point. Now, I went a little bit over, but that's okay, because we're still calculating the output for what 51.17 inches of water should be. So not a problem. And also, I'm not taking the time to use my fine-tuning knob. I'm just using the pressure pump itself just for speed. So now we're coming back down. I'll revent this thing, and I'll try to vent it so that it, it does a slow leak, and I don't have to worry about fine-tuning it. So I close off my vent, it's already stable, now I'll vent it for the final time. Now we'll get our 0%. Now did it pass or did it fail? Well this passed. Now our largest error was 0.128% of span. Let me arrow down so we can see where that was. On the graph we can tell that our largest error, well it was our 0. And any time you adjust the span, you do alter your zero. So you may have to go back and forth. Um, and I normally adjust my zero first, and then I adjust my span. And then I'll, if both of them are okay, I'm done. But I might go back and readjust the zero after that. But this is pretty quick. And again, we're doing this because of time. Otherwise, we probably would have had a, a very flat line if we would have completed it. 
Let me hit the Save button. I'll save this as left, and this will combine it with that previous as found. And this way, when we do a, a calibration certificate, it'll capture uh, both sets of data. All right, let me hit back here. And just real quick, let me click on the, the button here for our, our test results. So I'm looking at this graph after we trimmed it. If I hit the menu button on the top left, I can click on show older result. So now we can see that by adjusting the span, we pulled it within tolerance. So we click again, you can see the newer result. And this is how we left it. And if we unload this into software, then we can print out a calibration certificate that shows both results, both our original as found, the failed, and then the more of the flatter as left. So at this point, Hunter, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks, sir. All right. Let's move on. Um, to a different arrangement. Um, let's say we're trying to measure the air pressure in a, our, uh, a airline, and at normal pressure, we'll just randomly say it's 10 pounds, and the airline is up in the air. Uh, let's say it's, it's you know, 20, 30 feet up in the pipe rack. We don't want to make our poor uh, technicians climb all the way up into the pipe rack to go measure, calibrate transmitters. So we put the transmitter down near the ground, and just run some tubing or a, a line up to connect to the air uh, line. Question is, will this work? And the answer is yes, at least for a while. Initially, as long as the uh, uh, line is clean and, and there's no water or anything in the line, then yes, the transmitter will read the same as the airline, and that'd be 10 pounds. But um, if we, if there's any water in the airline, well, then what'll happen is it'll gradually fill up the connection line, the static line. And now the transmitter is going to be reading the 10 pounds of pressure plus the weight of the water. And so it's going to be reading something more than 10 pounds, and we don't know exactly how much because we don't know how much water is in the line. So this obviously is not a good answer. We don't want our transmitters reading some random number that might kind of approach the actual number. And so how do we fix it? Well, in this particular case for an air connection, we would bring the transmitter above the line. Now the water drains down into the line if there's any condensation whatsoever, and our transmitter is always reading the same as the air pressure in the line, and so we're good to go. That resolves that problem. And then we move to a different situation. Let's say we have a steam flow line. And in this case, we're going to randomly say it's got 20 pounds of pressure in it and 400 degrees. Well, how will our transmitter work in this particular situation now? Well, initially it'll read 20 pounds like it supposed to, but unfortunately steam is hot, and since it tends to rise, it's going to eventually cook the transmitter, and you'll have to replace it, uh, especially if that connection line is relatively short. So that's obviously not a good solution for us, and so we need to have a better way because we don't need to be replacing $1,500 transmitters routinely. So what do we do? Well, we move the pressure transmitter below the line. And then, of course, immediately you're going to think, well, wait a minute, that screwed us up before. It's going to screw us up here, too. And you'd be right. Um, as soon as you move the transmitter below the line, the steam is going to condense in that static line, and it's going to gradually fill it up with water. And as it fills it up with water, of course, the reading is going to get higher. And so eventually, in this particular case, if we have 23 feet of static line, it's going to add another 10 pounds uh, of weight to the transmitter, the transmitter is going to be reading 30 psi, and the line pressure is only 20. So how do we fix this? Well, the way you fix this is to elevate to zero. We calibrate the transmitter so that 10 pounds is 4 milliamps out, and 40 pounds is um, 20 milliamps out, but the DCS reads 10, zero to 30. So when the transmitter is reading 10 pounds, there is no pressure in the line, and the DCS is going to read zero. When there's 30 pounds of pressure in the line, the, DC, uh, the transmitter is going to read 30 plus the 10 or 40, but the DCS is going to read 30. So the DCS will be reading correctly by shifting to zero. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Roy and let him show you all that happening. So, Roy, it is all you, sir. 
All right, thank you, Hunter. Let me share my screen again. So we'll do an elevated zero. If we look at the next example, I've got, this is a, a Rosemont 3051 pressure transmitter. And I've got the, uh, uh, the a fitting here that I can hook up to, and I'll connect my plus and minus loop power onto the back of the transmitter so that we can power it up, as well as measure milliamps on the output. So I just need to get that connected here. Now this transmitter is 0 to 250 inches of water. So 0 to 250 equates to 4 to 20 milliamps out, which is represented right here. 0 to 250, 4 to 20. But because this is an elevated 0, we have a, a wet leg with 10 inches of water in it. So when we're measuring 10 inches of water, that's actually our 4 milliamp point. So we can't do it 0 to 250. So what we do is we simply change the transmitter to 10 to 260. Let me get rid of these two here. So 10 inches of water will equal 4 milliamps out, and 260 inches will equal 20 milliamps out. And then we'll get this perfectly straight line again. That is straight, right? And again, if we were doing a square root, then we'd have a, a curve that simply looks like this, but I'm not going to draw that on here. And then we have our tolerance again. I've got a negative 0.5% of tolerance. So I'll put some, some dashed lines in here. So our results don't have to be perfect on this line. We have a half a percent of span tolerance to give us uh, a, ability for some movement. So now I'll, I'll connect up my transmitter. And with this type of fitting, I actually like to put the O-ring in all the way before I even start threading it. Because it's, a, it's a, a brass connector, and that way I have uh, almost no ability to even cross-thread this piece. This transmitter is called PT250, so let me select that. All right, and this shows us 10 inches to 260 inches of water. And just to restate the point that this could be 10 to 260 bar, it could be PSI, it could be kilopascals, it does, it, the unit itself doesn't matter as far as uh, the test itself. And we have 4 to 20 milliamps out. Let me hit the, hit the OK button here. And the first thing we do is we always zero with our pump vented, zero to at atmosphere. So I'll press a zero before we get started. And now I'll press start. I'm just adjusting my fine tune knob to give me more room in case I need to, to use that. So I'll hit zero. And the bottom right tells me where I'm going. It tells me to put 10 inches of water on the input. So I'll close off my vent. And I'm going to use a fine tune knob on this guy just because 10 inches of water is not a lot. You can see that we're within our window now to accept it, but let me get it close to 10. All right, I went a little bit over, but that's okay because it's calculating what the output should be at 10.14. So it's, it's not a problem. Now we'll take it up. The bottom right tells me to go to 135 units on my input. Okay. All right, it's not looking good. Right now, those first two test points are red. Red indicates that they're both failing. Now we take it up to 260. So I'm, I'm squeezing the scissor portion of the pump. I could use the fine tune knob if I needed to. And I'll just I'll do that. I'll adjust it up a little bit more. Okay, I went a bit too far. That's okay. 260.12. Now we'll take it back to our midpoint, 135. So I'm just cracking the vent. And again, just in just in case, as far as the video portion, you can resize that video by grabbing on either the bottom left or the upper right-hand corner, making it a little bit uh, different size. And if you did happen to double-click on the video and you can't figure out how to get back, then just 
click on the upper right hand section where it says exit full screen and that will fix that for you. So we're almost there. I'm just letting the, the pressure bleed out. This is one of those things if I adjust it more then I'll probably lose it. Okay, I'll take that. And now in this case, if I, we need 10 inches, but if I forget and I, I vent out the entire thing, I'm, I'm at zero. So it's not going to accept it because it's the wrong input value. But what happens in pressure when we go past a, a, a set point too far, here's how you do that. I don't just increase pressure until I rise back up to my 10. I have to go past the 10 and come back down to it. So let me increase the pressure, and I'm going to go past it on purpose. Okay, so that's good. Now I'm above it, and I'll come back down. I'll vent out my pump. And this is the same thing if you're on the upward path. If you blow past something going up, then you do the same thing. You come back below it and reapproach it again. So I'm just venting here. Get it a little closer to 10. Now I was adjusting it. Um, it also recounted the uh, my three-second timer because it noticed that it wasn't stable because I was actually manipulating it right here. All right, did it pass or fail? Again, put your technician hat on. Do you get nervous and want to delete these results and then trim it and test it again? The answer is no. You want these results as ugly as they are because this is what gives you trending analysis. So we'll save this. I'll click on the disk. I'll save this as found and hit the check mark. The check mark is also the same thing as OK. Just like the last one, let me click the menu button on the top left and start communicator. Because again, this is a heart transmitter, so we're not going to get in here with a screwdriver and tweak something. We need a communicator aspect. So one thing that we noticed with that graph, let me draw this out for you guys. We have 10 to 260, but on the calibrator we have that zero line, which represents no error. And then we have our, the blue lines on the calibrator, which represent our tolerance. And all the way across the bottom, let me change colors here, we had test points that were below our, our tolerance. So we had a straight line. Okay, that's not straight. Pretend that's a straight line below our tolerance. Do we have to adjust our zero or our span? You remember the last one, the span was out, so we had a line that kind of went like this. We need to fix our zero. And it is good practice to, to adjust both your zero and the span, but again, I'm just uh, doing one of them, the main one, just for the sake of time. So this one, we want service tools, maintenance, pressure calibration, Now we can do either our zero or the lower. No, we can't. We have to do our lower because we have an off a zero shift. Let's do this. Let's do a lower. Warning, loop should be removed from automatic control. Select our pressure units, inches of water is what we have, that's good. And apply our low pressure. Now the the pressure is still in the line from what we had before it, and let me just dial it down so it's closer to 10 that I want. Because at 10 inches of water, we should be getting 4 milliamps. And right now, at 10, we're getting 3.90 milliamps. That's our error. So there's 10. Let me hit the check mark. And yeah, it is stable. And now I'm saying that I'm actually applying 10.01 inches of water and watch this output, you see it's self-adjusting. So this is trimming our zero. Now it says remove pressure, I'll hit the check mark. 
lower trim succeeded. I'll hit check. And again, pressure calibration, executing method that's going across the top. We can't do anything while that's happening. So while we are waiting for that, I do want to thank everyone again from attending and from just the, the vast number of countries that are represented here. I appreciate that. Now, we will have a Q&A section coming up shortly, so if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A spot. So this is done. I can hit the X, and I'm still inside of my test. So the idea here is to get a, an as found, and in this case, it failed. So we want to capture that. Then we do an adjustment in the middle, and then we'll do an as left. So we should see a, a zero shift problem on the as found, and the as left should be a better looking graph. All right, so I still have 10 inches of water in my line. I'm going to hit start, and that's what I want. That'll hit my first test point. So that's good. So we have 0.006% of span error. This is much better than the last one. So I'll take my pressure up again. I'll just hit these gray bars so it doesn't have to be perfect. All right, good. Now I'll hit my 100%. Do I have to be exactly on it? And the answer is no. Unless your processes and procedures require you to be dead on, this will calculate any error between the input versus the output. So once we get close, I'll close off my vent. All right, that's good. And now, I went past it on purpose last time, but I'll just try to land on it correctly this time. If I do end up going past and going too far below, I'll have to come above the test point and come back down to it. It's no big deal. All right, and this one passed. So if we wanted to, as a technician, I could check out the graph itself. I could check out the raw data. Now, I, I could also go down and I could enter in my values as far as what was the ambient temperature, what was the temperature of the device under test, the, the humidity. So I'm in Colorado. I don't even know what it is now. It's probably 25%. 40% humidity here is the unbearable limit. That's how dry it is. Our barometric pressure came over automatically. Our temperatures from the calibrator came over automatically. And let me save this. Save it as left. Now, I'm, I'm actually done testing, so I can hit the home button with the green circle up on top. This takes me back to the main screen. And I want to show, let me share one other thing. I've got a calibration certificate that represents what we did. And it's not this exact test. I didn't want to take the time to just unload the test. It would only take in a minute. But this is what a calibration certificate looks like. You can see in red the as found. And it's red meaning, and it's actually this one was a passing as found. But it was far enough off, and I wanted to do a trim. So this, this shows you what the effect of the adjustment is. Let me go back to the calibrator. So at this point, we're actually done with the with the two calibrations. We did a 0 to 100. We did a 10 to 260 elevated zero test. And we have a question and answer coming up. So again, any questions, put them in the Q&A section. And I do want to say that at the end of this, there will be a survey that pops up. And please don't just click out of that. We want your feedback. This webinar that we're doing now is a direct result of the feedback you gave us last time. The last time we did a, a presentation on calibrating smart instruments, we covered temperature, we covered pressure, 
And we asked you, what do you want to see next? And this was your answer. You wanted to see pressure. Now, you also wanted to see how to calibrate level, how to calibrate single or dual diaphragm seals. And that is coming, but it's, it was too much for this one webinar. So this is kind of like pressure 101, the starting point. The next point will be like a pressure 201, but we'll call that pressure calibration part two. So please put your feedback in the survey at the end and let us know what you want to see coming up in future webinars. So Stacy, with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Roy. We have some great questions coming in. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Okay, what effect does temperature have on pressure, i.e. 32 degrees Fahrenheit versus 60 degrees Fahrenheit? Hunter, how do you feel about that? I, I, that's a hard question to answer because I'm not exactly sure. Stacey, re read the question again. Um, it says, sorry, let me get back. What effect does temperature have on pressure? As in 32 degrees Fahrenheit versus 60 degrees, as an example. There, there are a couple of ways to answer that, and since I don't know the specifics of the question, it's hard for me to answer, but I'll address a couple of them, and then Ned, chime in if you want. There, first of all, there's, there's standard temperatures for like inches of water is, is one. I think the, the standard uh, temperature where you would measure the inches of water is at, I believe, 68 degrees in the U.S. I believe at 4 degrees centigrade or something in, in England. And so you do have uh, units of pressure that are actually tied to a standard temperature, and, and that can um, give you some slight variations depending on what specific unit you have. And in fact, you'll see those different units in the calibrators, you know, that you, you pick as your standard. Um, and, and then if you're talking about just measuring pressure, uh, temperature shouldn't have any effect on the pressure other than, than whatever effect it has. In other words, I mean, if, if I'm reading so many inches of water, then it's always that many inches of water. Now, granted, if I cool the air, then it's going to tend to be heavier, and so the inches of water may go up, but, but the reading is what the reading is. Um, Ned, is there something I missed, or do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, I, think, I think maybe the question might have to do with ambient. could be ambient temperature as well, Hunter, so I think you were talking about the process temperature. and um, You know, when you talk about water at six at 20 degrees C or 4 degrees C, which is kind of an ambient room temperature versus a cold temperature, and 4 degrees is right before the molecules transition to freezing mode. Uh, you know, think of liquid going to solid, the molecules are, are getting closer together, they're denser. So, uh, so temperature does affect, uh, you know, process temperature would affect the measurement to some degree. But um, if, it, if we're talking ambient temperature, it, in either case, it's kind of a minor effect. And when you look at the error of your measurement, let's, let's look at it from that perspective. You're trying to make an accurate measurement. You're trying to measure 100 PSI. What's the difference at 32 versus 50? Well, that temperature can affect the calibrator that's making the measurement. It can affect the sensor if it has temperature compensation built into it. You know, is it good? Is it poor? And so all these things can affect the overall measurement. And I sort of throw temperature in as a, as a random error. You know, you're looking for systematic error and random error when you're trying to analyze what's causing a problem. And there's not much you can do about temperature. If you go out on a cold day, you go out on a hot day, you know, you're, that's when it's scheduled. So it's good to note the temperature, I would say, and maybe if you're trending, if you're doing this documentation, then you can see, is temperature causing you a problem? You know, maybe when you make measurements in the dead of winter versus the middle of summer, you're seeing some effect, and then that would cause you to maybe pick a better instrument to make the measurement that has better temperature compensation in it. Uh, you might have to look at your practices. So it's, a, it's kind of a random error that you 
you should document, but there's not a whole lot you can do about it. One one last thing I will add to what Ned said. Temperature absolutely does affect a pressure measurement if you've got diaphragm seals. And we'll talk more about that in part two. But what will happen is that the liquid inside the diaphragm seal will either contract or expand based on temperature. And so your zero will shift. You know, if you've got a large diaphragm seal and measuring, say, a, a process tank and the temperature is changing in that tank, it will actually affect the diaphragm seal itself and thus give you false pressure changes in your transmitter. Okay, thanks, guys. On a pressure transmitter, is 420 MA my input or output when powered up by a handheld? Uh, to me, it's typically the output. 4 to 20 is what's being sent to the control system or PLC, so that's that's your output. Well, I guess it's the output of a transmitter, or it could be the input to the control system. Or the fluke that you're reading it on, yes. Or the calibrator. Or a calibrator, right. Okay, a Venturi DP cell flow meter, how will air influence, if any, the measurement? I, I saw that one pop up, and I guess I was a little – normally when you're measuring a DP on, on a, any kind of a flow meter, you, know, you have a high and a low side hooked to the process. And so, you know, the, you, the, the reason you hook up the low side to the process is to negate out the, the pressure effects in the line. So you're measuring the actual differential pressure across the annual bar or the Venturi or the orifice plate or whatever you are. And so – it shouldn't – that's why you hook it up that way. Now, there are people that if they're measuring airflow and there's no um, – they may only hook up one side, the positive side, and just vent the low side. And in a case like that, then, yeah, ambient conditions will shift your reading some. But normally, you hook up a differential pressure uh, measurement with both the high and the low hooked up so that you're compensating any effects and, and taking that away. Okay, Roy, what were the connection fittings called that you were using? So I'm actually Ned, do you know what this one's called? Well, it's a uh it's a quick connect fitting and it's compatible with a quarter inch swage lock tube fitting. So it's it's a way to quick connect to a, a swage lock or equivalent fitting. So Parker has a line they call A lock, and there's gyro lock and true lock. There's other brands of tube fittings, but the the one that Roy was demonstrating is it connects to a quarter inch tube fitting. Okay. Did you say that for a differential pressure transmitter that you can't that you cannot set the low point at zero in water? No, no. You obviously you can set a differential pressure transmitter to zero. You can set it at that negative number. I, I think in the particular case Roy was talking about, he was trying to give you a demonstration of an elevated zero. And so, in this particular case, the, what he was demonstrating to you was he was setting it rather than zero to 250, he was setting it 10 to 260. And so, in that particular case, he didn't want to go to zero. He only wanted to go to 10. I, I believe that's just. But normally, yeah, you can set the differential transmitter or however you need it to be within the range of the transmitter itself. True. Okay. Uh, to add on to that, Hunter, like there's some transmitters that monitor room airflow, typically in a pharmaceutical application where they want to um, make sure there's a positive airflow so no contaminants come into their manufacturing room. And I've seen them like a quarter inch of water or plus or minus a quarter inch of water, a really, really low pressure. And uh, the way to, to, to calibrate that sensor is to take a piece of tubing and just short the high connection to the low connection. You just have this straight tubing. But that's the best way to simulate zero, you know, to that type of transmitter. So, so you absolutely... You know, and and if it was if it's plus or minus a quarter, in that in that instance, when you're zero, when you have that transmitter zeroed, 
you would expect to see 12.00 whatever milliamps. It would, you know, that would be the mid scale of the range. So, so yeah, you you can either have it zero based, or sometimes zero can be uh, in the middle, or what Roy demonstrated today, it can be elevated. There is no zero. It's, it was 10 to 260. Okay. Using our MC5 and test pump to calibrate mag magnahelic mag gauges. Magnahelic. Magnahelic. Thank gauges. you. <laughs> a lot of times we experience a noticeable leak or decay. What rate of decay is acceptable when testing a gauge that reads 0 to 0 0.5 in water, and what can we do to detect or prevent leaks in the test setup? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, yeah, so this is kind of what I was just talking about. Uh, the, the plus or minus quarter inch, the, the, uh, that span would be zero to half an inch. So, so uh, if you shorted the ends of the magnahelic together, that would be a, a true zero. So um, that, that's how I would check it at zero. And then the problem that you're probably, that you might be seeing is there's two things. You could have a leak when you're connected on the high side and also know that if you have the low side vented, because this is such a low span, that just somebody opening the door or the, a fan kicking on in your air conditioning, that airflow in the room will cause that magnahelic to flutter. So uh, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to get a stable zero when you're looking, when you're working in, on the span. So the, the real answer or the best answer would be to get a true differential sensor on your calibrator. So, uh, for example, BMEX has some different options, but uh, our lowest range that we offer is plus or minus four inches, and it actually has a high-low connection. So if you had our 10MD module, you would be able to hook the low side up to the low side of the magnahelic, and then the high side to your pump and then continue on to the high side of the magnahelic, and then you can take your pump and carefully generate a negative pressure or carefully generate a positive pressure. And, and with a closed system like that, you, you shouldn't have any problems. Okay, why is it important to understand rising and falling past the set point in, pre in pressure instrumentation? I believe in that sure. particular case, what uh, Roy was showing was that you, you want to me measure hysteresis, and you have rising hysteresis and falling hysteresis. And hysteresis is basically the difference in measurement if you approach a point from below or from above. Uh, and so he was moving up as he uh, calibrated on the first path and moving down as he calibrated on the second path so he could actually capture what that hysteresis was. And that was why it was important to always approach it from the same direction. Right, Roy, or you want to add that? Is that is right on. Thank you, Hunter. Okay, which is a tighter calibration, 0% of fan or 0% of readings? Reading. I'm sorry, just percentage, not zero. What is a tighter calibration, percentage of fan or percentage of reading? Uh, definitely reading. Um, we need Roy's pad of paper and, a, and a, have him draw it, but... Um, Percent of span is, is a flat line. It's 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 a, it would fall above the zero. So remember, Roy was showing half percent was the dotted blue line on high and low. So that would be a percent of span type number. Um, when it's percent of reading, it's going to be a slanted number. It's going to be just slightly above zero and then get higher as you go to full scale. So let's say you wanted to be within half percent of span or half percent of reading. Uh, it's it's going to it's going to be this flat line at half percent kind of like Roy drew, but then if you if you had a line running from 0 up to the half percent, you'd be cutting that rectangle in half. So so you could say percent of reading is requires twice as good performance as percent of span. Right. And if you're trying to measure zero, then percent of reading, you have to be infinitely perfect 
right? Because any percent of zero is going to be zero, so you couldn't have any error whatsoever at the zero point. Right, so we would recommend that you have an initial test point with a little bit of a floor. I, I always recommend about 1% of the, the, the range. So for, um, you know, for 250 inches, I would, I would have my first test point at like 2.5 instead of zero. Okay, we are getting close to time, so I'm only going to read two more questions. Um, we have a lot come in for this second round. So if your question is not answered, I encourage everyone to reach out to the presenters directly. Um, their information is on the screen right now. Um, so two more questions, guys. In your experience, what are the main industries with the biggest need for pressure calibration? Is this pneumatic pressure calibration mostly or hydraulic pressure as well? I'm sorry, reread re that one again, uh, Stacey? In your experience, what are the main industries with the biggest need for pressure calibration? Is this pneumatic pressure calibration mostly or hydraulic pressure as well? BMAX oh, has done a survey and, and um, we have found in, in typical process plants, so I'm, we're talking chemical, paper, uh, those type of industries, Pressure is is typically 60% of the applications in a plant. Uh, temperature maybe is the next important one at uh, anywhere from 20 to 30%. So uh, depending on the specific industry, it, it's you know those are just averages. But that's one reason we wanted to pick pressure as a topic, is we feel this is the the, the most important measurement application that uh, people in ISA would deal with. And then to your question, by far uh, we see pneumatic type pressures. Even, even, if, even in a water treatment plant, you, you can test the instrument with air. You're not, you don't have to use water to, uh, to generate the pressure. So uh, people are using hydraulic pressure to generate higher pressures. It, it's, there's pumps out there that can generate 10,000, even 30,000 PSI using either hydraulic oil or, or water. So, so my experience is, but sometimes you don't want to expose your sensors to water, so people will use a test bottle that can go as high as 6,000 PSI. Wow. They'll use that with a regulator to, to test their instrumentation. So, I, but I guess pneumatic testing by far is what we see. Okay, and can this equipment be used in hazardous areas? I assume you're talking uh, about your calibrator directly. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, when you're in a, an aerated, what I call a rated area, and you're trying to uh, work in an in an intrinsic safe type environment. Uh, the calibrator needs to meet the rating of the area. Uh, it needs to meet it or exceed it. Um, so, but if you're going out with a hot work permit, so I use the term sniffing, if you go out and sniff the area prior to, to uh, opening any cabinets, you're, you're making a, a test with an analytical device and you're declaring that the area is free of any hazardous gases. And uh, in that instance, you can use any kind of calibrator. But uh, to work safely, there are intrinsically safe rated calibrators. BMX has several models and um, uh, you need to pick one and make sure it fits, fits the rating of your area to, be, to work safely. Okay, thanks guys. These have been some fantastic questions and I just want to thank everyone who participated. If you would like to discuss this topic face-to-face, -face, visit Roy and the BMEX team at ISA's Process Control and Safety Symposium next week in Houston, Texas. If you haven't registered yet, registration is still open. You simply go to isa.org slash PCS to learn more. In our future part two webinar, we will investigate more advanced calibration situations 
including differential pressure level calibration, level calibrations with wet legs, which are often found on steam drums, and single and dual diaphragm seal calibrations. We will send out a webinar invitation to e via email once the date has been set, so be on the lookout for that. If you missed any portion of this webinar or if you would like to watch the recorded version, we will be emailing all registrants a link to the recording along with additional links for supporting information. So be on the lookout for an email from me in the next couple of days. This concludes the How to Calibrate Pressure Instruments Part 1 webinar. Thank you for attending and we hope you acquired useful information and we hope to see you again in one of our future webinars. Thanks and have a great day. All right, thanks everybody. Don't forget that survey. Fill out what you'd like to see next.